Welcome, my name is Angel Quattra and we're, welcome to Workplace Safety North, Feed Your Brain in North Bay, Ontario. Welcome to all of you who are joining us online. Uh, we understand we have you from mostly across Ontario but across the country. So it's a beautiful day in North Bay, hope you're having a lovely day also. So this is our fourth series and uh, just like every other one of them, 100% sold out. So obviously the topics that you've chosen are topics that are near and dear to your heart and we're hoping we can answer some of your questions. For questions that we can answer, at the end of the presentation, you'll have the option to have the PowerPoint and there's numerous resources attached to it, so feel free to look at that. It includes links to legislation and also policy development. So our speaker today is Randy Herman. And the last time I introduced Randy, I neglected to read his bio and I read it again this morning and I was pretty impressed with it. So I thought you might enjoy hearing a little bit about it. Randy is a former paramedic who supported flight transportation. So I'm sure he's seen a lot in that particular role, but he was also a site manager to the United Nations, which I thought was incredibly brilliant. And in this role, he oversaw the health and safety of his team. So like yourself, he has has some background in health and safety and keeping people safe. And for the last year, eight years, he's been the national sales manager with Can-Am. And so in this role, he's assisting companies in the planning and the implementation for their fit to work programs. I've come to know Randy in the last few months when I approached him to do this series. He was right away, yes, we'll do it. And I went, wow, that was so easy. And he has been absolutely incredible in sharing the resources, not only of Can-Am, but of their clients across the country. And I understand when he comes up to the podium, he's also going to be introducing one of his colleagues. So with that, I'd like to hand, this is called the crown for those of you who are out in webinar land. And I'd like to hand the crown to Randy Herman from Can-Am. Thanks, Angel. I recognize a lot of faces in this room. Um, I brought a colleague today with me. Her name is Monica McComsky. She's one of our uh, kick out managers across Canada, and uh, she looks after our clients. Um, clearly, uh, we're all here because it's a huge topic. I think today they're in session in the Senate discussing this very topic. Uh, there's a lot of common misconceptions. Uh, medical uses, how I came about, how it affects us, uh, dealing with marijuana in your workplaces and the legalization. Uh, marijuana and safety sensitive positions. Okay. Okay, what is marijuana? We all know what that is. It's the, the stuff that smells funny. The whole nation's talking about it. Okay. I won't get into too much depth about what it is. But I will discuss this. This is a very important point from a workplace standpoint. Okay, the root of administration, you can see from the slide that there's various ways. Some of them are very surprising. But the root of administration of marijuana directly affects the onset and the duration in which it affects our bodies. So if you were to smoke it, it'll hit you from one to three minutes. And it usually lasts anywhere from one to six hours, depending on your dosage. Um, the people that, um, edibles, which we're not going to seek immediately in the Canadian market, it can take anywhere from 30 up to 90 minutes for someone to feel the effects of marijuana when they eat it, okay? And uh, interestingly enough, this is two weeks ago, I got a call from, we call them designated employee representatives, uh, specific people for organizations that work for companies, called me and they, um, it was around noon and they were like, they said they had two employees that were acting crazy. And apparently in the morning toolbox talk, they were, they were absolutely normal. And uh, we live in an era, an era of instant gratification. My children have iPads, uh, uh, iPhones, you name it, right? So it's kind of the generation. Um, anyway, so these two individuals, I guess, had eaten edibles around their breakfast time break. They didn't feel the effects. Like, like Later, apparently, they end up in the emergency room. And the strange thing about marijuana is that it doesn't affect your respiratory center it means you can't overdose on it. You just can get really, really high. And um, unlike most of, a lot of other drugs, it affects your respiratory center like alcohol. If you drink too much, eventually you'll just go into a coma and die. So from a workplace standpoint, this is really crucial. With the uh, marijuana, you don't have the same, with the edibles, there's not the same tell signs like the smells. 
somebody could bring it in their lunch box. So clearly it's going to be potentially a workplace issue and you might not get seen the same other tell signs with uh, the eyes, you know, you get the red eyes and things like that. Okay, so they obviously the topic is broader than just the smoke route. Okay, so in fact, in Colorado, uh, from 2013 to the 2014, the following year, the uh, sale of edibles had gone up by 134%. Okay, there's an interesting fact here. <laughs> there are more dispensaries in Colorado than Starbucks, McDonald's, and 7-Elevens combined. Okay, so we're, are we going to see this in Ontario? Are there going to be more than there are Tim Hortons? That's really a stretch, but <laughs> um, that being said, though, um, initially we're starting with, uh, I think there's 30, and uh, people are going to be given, I think the allotment is 30 grams per person, which is quite a large amount, so they'll go to the dispensary, whether it be in Sudbury or wherever, pick up their stuff, and they're still ironing out the details on the amounts. Okay, this is the current legal status for medical authorization. Okay, the blue indicates areas where it's, uh, it's legal for, for medical authorizations to take marijuana. Uh, the light blue regions are it's where it's decriminalized. And uh, the pink, are, it's uh, illegal but often unenforced, probably because they can't. And the red areas are illegal. And we obviously, there's kind of a trend here. If you go to the next slide, this area where it's currently legal for recreational use, we're gonna see a bunch, same thing, blue is where it's, it's gonna be all blue here. Sometime we're thinking, initially it was gonna be July. Now we're looking at, you know, who knows when, right? The next few months. Um, and now in the United States, there's eight states that have uh, approved the legalization of marijuana. And I, my understanding is it accounts for 75 million people in the United States. Okay, just a little bit of the history. We know that marijuana has been around for thousands of years. It was uh, initially used for fiber and rope. Uh, the earliest medical application we know of is by the Emperor of China in uh, 2737 BC. And then it became part of the um, British and the US pharmacology in the mid 1800s. I won't get too deep into this area, but it's quickly evolved since then. We know about the war on drugs. The United Nations came together in 1961 and kind of agreed on principles to ensure that um, the uh, production, distribution, and consumption of certain narcotic drugs were limited or prohibited. Um, but probably the most dramatic case in Canada that we've seen was in 1997. Uh, that was when the first case were, uh, was a legal case where it was Marijuana consumption was allowed for a person that had uh, life-ending life illness, right? It was for compassionate reasons. And it became a big legal case. And as a result of that, in 2001, the medical marijuana access regulations came to be. Okay, and it's quickly evolved. We know that it's evolved quickly and um, it's not going anywhere. We're gonna have to learn how to deal with it as a society. Okay, and this is when the, um, in 2001, uh, the government was in charge of production and distribution to people out of these authorizations. And then in 2013, this is when the, these authorizations skyrocketed. Um, the government downloaded kind of as the gatekeepers to doctors and nurse practitioners. They were responsible for giving these authorizations to, um, to people that, that were approved to get these. And at this point, um, it went into the thousands, okay? And then in 2016, it went further where people that had these authorizations could grow it themselves or they could designate a friend to do it on their behalf, which created further problems because there was no um, regulation on the strain that the marijuana used, the dosage, the amount, nothing like that. So then it started to creep into the concern for the workplaces. Okay, so how does marijuana affect us? Okay, we can think of it as keys. Okay, there's three main keys with regard to uh, marijuana or cannabis. Okay, there's the first category is phytocannabinoids. 
Uh, that's what comes from the marijuana plant in itself. There's endocannabinoids. So our bodies actually produce their own version of THC. And synthetic cannabinoids, uh, if you're not familiar with it, they're produced in a lab. Uh, there was a lot of news about the, these ones a few years ago. Uh, has anybody heard of K2 or bath salts? So a lot of these were supposed to mimic the feelings of marijuana, but we're seeing less of them, and we're getting less calls about them because they're so dangerous, and usually people that are taking them don't end up in the workplace very long. We get, uh, I can't count how many calls we get companies, what are we gonna do about this? How can we test it for these? Well, with the designer drugs, um, a lot of these will have like thousands of compounds. All they have to do is change a, a few of them, and you can't test for them. Well, luckily, that they're not in our workplaces. Oh, so cannabis is like, it acts like, um, it's like keys, opening a door, okay? It knows when to, like our body has an endocannabinoid system that knows when to open or close doors. You kind of think of it in your house, controlling airflow. When you introduce marijuana to someone's endocannabinoid system, it can open doors that would otherwise not be opened. Okay, and these doors that are open, what we call, they can affect the way people think and do things. Does that make sense? And this is what we call psychoactive. Okay, it targets receptors in our system. So psychoactive affects the way we think and do things. Yeah, so the marijuana plant, of these compounds that are in, within the, marijuana, uh, the phytocannabinoids, there's 104 no inactive compounds in a marijuana plant. 70% of them, or 70 of them, are known to be psychoactive. Like I said, that means that they affect that we think and do things, affects our, all our processes, okay? And these are the top six by concentration. The red ones are the ones known to be psychoactive. Obviously, everyone's heard of THC, and it's the most, it's got the highest concentration in the marijuana plant. So how often do we hear people comparing marijuana to alcohol? All the time. Okay. Um, this is one of the myths that are out there. They're completely two different, like we talked about the 70 active compounds. Marijuana does affect each, us, each of us the same way in some ways. Um, right here is your cerebellum. So that's the part of your brain that's part responsible for our gait and our coordination. So if you see someone, they've had about three or four drinks, they're after work or a Friday night, you know, you start to slur your words or you sway. Marijuana somewhat affects you like that, but that's only for like the one to six hours, okay? And that's your cerebellum. So that's one similarity between the two of them. Uh, another area is your hippocampus. So if someone would smoke a moderate amount, that's the area part of your brain responsible for your memory. It can be affected by one to two days after. So think about your toolbox top talk in the morning. Uh, someone might not remember what was discussed in the morning. So this can affect you for far longer than the six hours. Uh, the neocortex, that's an area, very important area, part of your brain, responsible for our higher function, our executive function, being able to put, coordinate and put things together. So the interesting thing about this, um, uh, a series of, there was about six doctors that did a study in 1991. It was a very small study of 10 pilots. Has everybody heard of a, simulator test. So every year a pilot has to go in and they have to get recertified to keep their commercial license. And they go into a, a thing and they have to test, take off with the plane, land it. And uh, so the study was done on 10 pilots. And um, what happened was only they were given 20 milligrams of THC. And then 24 hours later, they did the simulator test. And these were all veteran pilots that had, I think it was over 5,000 hours each. And only one of the 10 could successfully pass the, the thing. And the most frightening thing about this was, uh, not one of them were aware that, that they weren't performing to the way that they should be. So they were unaware of their so-called impairment because they didn't feel it. Okay, and another area, the amygdala, uh, you know what made me think about this one? When I was thinking about this last night. I was thinking about uh, Rob. He did a presentation for us about sort of video of a mind site. And, uh, and all these people were doing all these things and the coordinating of 
Like it looks like, the, to me it looked like they were doing a dance. And um, if your fear response is not there and your head's not on straight, one person does one thing wrong, then either you're going to get killed or your friend beside you is going to get killed. That's the one thing that really stood out when I saw that. It really was shocking. Yeah, here's just a few other things. People think that um, marijuana is not addictive. Uh, we know that the concentration, is, well, I'll cover that a little bit more, is much higher. Uh, lifetime risk of someone from alcohol, these are statistics from the nation. Uh, people that use alcohol, three out of 20 uh, will um, develop an addiction problem. Marijuana, two out of 20. Okay, and we can see that the, um, the body metabolizes um, both alcohol and marijuana in the same way through the liver, uh, but the uh, lingering effects of marijuana last longer than alcohol, the half-life's longer. And it depends on a series of factors, which I will cover. Okay, so recently absent users from marijuana, they can be, they can have effects from seven to 20 days. And that sounds pretty alarming, doesn't it? You know, we talk about what you do on your own time as your business. Well, when you have a chronic smoker, we're talking about the 20 hours, that's someone who uh, primarily, this is the executive function that we talked about will be affected. Uh, marijuana is what we call a fat soluble drug. Most other drugs are water soluble. So your person will metabolize it within one to three days. Uh, with marijuana, um, if you have a heavy chronic smoker that's um, basically over a long period of time, it builds up in their system. And as they metabolize it, there's studies now that are showing by the World Health Organization uh, that can, the person can be affected for far longer than the six hours. And back to the pilot thing. So complex human machine performance can be impaired for as long as 24 hours after smoking a moderate dose of cannabis. And the user, like I said, may not even be impaired, uh, be even aware of the influence. Health Canada states the same thing. Depending on the dose, people can be affected for more than 24 hours. And we're trying to balance people's human rights with safety. Like this is what we're really talking about. I'm not trying to, we're not trying to make a value judgment. We're just trying to bring the facts here as best as we can. Okay. So we were talking about working beside someone. Would you want to work with someone with decreased? Do we want our employees to feel uncomfortable at work? Working beside someone with decreased attention, compromised judgment, distorted sense of perception, huge. So just a little recap on what we've covered so far. Uh, we know that there's a profound risk with people using marijuana. We know that the neurocognitive impairment can last over 24 hours. And we know that alcohol and marijuana are not, not at all in the same ballpark. And these are, these are studies that come from, this isn't me telling you, this is coming from uh, medical journals, doctors. Okay. How often do we hear in the news about impairment? Everybody wants a, a drug test in your workplace. Oh, I need to know if my friend's impaired right now. What, what, about, what about their rights, right? How, we've all read about that. Um, the Toronto Transit, um, they started random testing. And the uh, Supreme Court said that they had to raise their cutoff level for oral fluid testing. And the reason why is because they're trying to show impairment. So I need to be very clear about here. No drug tests can show impairment. It's not possible. Um, it takes a, there's a lot of factors that affect impairment. A person's metabolism. Are they already a chronic user? If you have someone that's never smoked marijuana before, they're gonna get much more high than someone that's smoking it daily. Like from the, remember the cerebellum? Um, they, as, well, as well as what people have eaten. Are they under any stress? Are they tired? There's a lot of factors there. And impairment's best determined by a trained supervisor like the police officer from the video. Um, in your workplace, that's really important. Because when we talk about a drug testing program, a lot of companies, will, or organizations, 
they think that that's the be all and end all. Like you need your supervisors to be able to recognize and feel comfortable with this. Because someone, someone might not even be under the influence of alcohol. They could have undiagnosed diabetes. People are, or they could be keto acid. Like when people's sugar levels drop, they become agitated. Or they could have lost a loved one. There's a series of factors. So the drug testing just rules that out. And statistically speaking, people that are above the, the cutoff levels that are out there are considered a more likely risk to cause an incident in your workplace. So impairment. So why is this a therapeutic use of interest from the first place from 1997? Well, like I said, it was for compassionate life-ending reasons. Usually somebody who has neurogenic problems, MS, and recently there are studies that show that people have uh, epileptic, severe epileptic seizures, that the marijuana will in fact help. And there are companies that do try to accommodate that, and we'll talk about that, accommodate their illness. But most of these people that are we're taking this initially, were people that you wouldn't see in your workplaces. So then we saw like 2016, all of a sudden, boom, everybody's got them. Everybody's got suspect clock home in Canada, thousands. <laughs> yeah, we talked about Dimitri, Demetrius, okay? So this is when we started to see it with other types of illnesses like this, okay? And the, the most common one we hear is glaucoma. Glaucoma is like a disease of the optic nerve that causes swelling and can lead to blindness. Uh, marijuana does actually help, but it'll only last for one to two hours. So a person would have to consume regularly. Uh, there is an alternative medicine that's called Dimox. They're eye drops. It will last for eight hours and there's no psychoactive effects. Okay, and cannabis, we've always heard, we've heard it's a prescription. No, it is not. I'm just gonna speed up a bit here, if that's okay with everyone. Just because I don't wanna, okay. The Medical, Canadian Medical Health Association feels that we have little to no evidence-based information about its use as a medical therapy, the lack of evidence to support the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes signifies that it is not a medical intervention. And this is the same with BC, Alberta, Ontario. The doctors don't feel that it's a medicine. Okay, and this is what a prescription would look at. Look like there's a series of things that, uh, like there's a DIN number, so there'd have to be indications, dosages, things like that. And with the 70 psychoactive compounds that I talked about, um, they are starting to come out with some things. There are a few drugs that, that do contain THC, uh, Sativax, Sazamet, and Marinol. So these are um, certified prescriptions that use THC but they only have one or two of the active compounds. So it's easier to understand how they act upon the person, how they interact with each other. And that doesn't mean that a person should be working in a dangerous workplace or at a job that their actions or lack of them could, be, could potentially hurt themselves or others. Actually, it even says in uh, Health Canada, Sativax may impair your ability to carry out complicated tasks. Patients should not drive or engage in activities requiring unimpaired judgment. And we'll get to all this. This is uh, stuff that's covered in your policy. If you have one, if you don't, you should uh, probably have one. <laughs> and we can discuss that. If, I mean, if you have a dangerous workplace. Okay, see, there, these are some national statistics for Canada. Um, a reasonable, this is a cause test, reasonable cause test. Someone comes into work, they smell like alcohol, or their behavior is erratic, and supervisor makes a decision, consults someone, and that's when they bring them in for a reasonable cause test. Okay, so you can see that that one's the most highest positive rate that we see. If you do see a high post-accident positive rate, it means that um, supervisors might, might not be catching the people before it's too late. Um, th there's a bunch of ser series of different things that we look at. But if you do look at your national di addiction rates, uh, it's around 3%, so meaning that um, there should be three to four reasonable cause tests in a safety sense of workplace per 100 employees annually. So if you do have a program, that's one thing that you should, would look at. If you see zero and you've got 1,000 employees, um, I'd like to think that a, the company might have their head in the sand because they're thinking that their workplace doesn't have anybody that has potentially a problem. And I don't mean to be bold or offend anyone. <laughs> 
Okay, and that's the positive rate in Canada for THC. It's two thirds of all positives that we see. And that was based on our testing in 2015, probably around anywhere between 350 and 200,000 tests. And we talk about, is marijuana addictive? Well, we, uh, that graph just kind of symbolizes that it's got the highest increase in people seeking uh, treatment for uh, marijuana addiction out of all the other drugs. Okay, this is another thing. So marijuana has quadrupled in concentration over the last 10 years globally. It used to be 3%. It used to be grass. Uh, now it's anywhere from 12 to 16%. Uh, in Canada, there's crops that grow at, at higher than 30%. So obviously when the government does bring this in, they're gonna have some regulations on it, obviously. Um, but there's different ways that people take it and they to turn it into an oil, there's a thing called shatter. Has anybody heard of this? It's like a liquid and it's 80% THC. So I think they grind it down, put it into an oil, I don't know the processing it, and they dab it and then smoke it. And it's extremely potent. You, can get, you can't overdose and die from marijuana because it doesn't affect your uh, brain stem. No, no, that's regular THC. And most of, the, most of the THC we see out there is pot, like the dried cannabis. And we're starting to see edibles. Um, but the edibles that you're gonna see in Canada initially are gonna be people making brownies at home because the government's not gonna put them out right away. Yeah. So we don't have, a, we don't, obviously we don't have a lot of statistics in Canada. Is it gonna affect our Canadian workplaces? Well, there's a perception that there's, uh, there's no risk. There's more accessibility. Obviously, there's a perceived thought across our country that there's no risk, so therefore there's gonna be an increased consumption and there's gonna be safety consequences on our highways and in our workplaces. And there's really no, the government's downloaded the responsibility onto us to determine how we're gonna deal with this in our workplaces as well as even the roadsides. I believe that uh, the federal government has said that each province has to look after their own. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and that, it's a really good point. And um, yeah, they're gonna regulate the concentration for sure, whether it's um, prescription or not authorization, authorized or whether it's sold in the store. The fact of the matter, another thought that has occurred to me is that there's only 30 dispensaries in Ontario. So people are gonna go get, they can go get 30, they drive to Sudbury and they, they want it that bad. Do you think, and there's gonna be a, there's gonna be strict regulations on where you can smoke it. Are people, if your children are not allowed to smoke it anywhere, they're gonna smoke it in the car when they borrow dad's car. I there's so many things that, have, that come into my head. So in Washington, we know that the traffic related deaths, oh, my colleague uh, Dan Demers recently saw the recent statistics for uh, the US, they're much more alarming now. So I don't have those, but if I do have, once I do obtain them, I will forward them on. The fatal crashes involving drivers who recently used marijuana more than doubled from eight to 17% between 2013 and 2014. One of six drivers involved in fatal crashes in 2014 had recently used marijuana. So that's based on coronary, uh, coronary reports. So in Colorado, 48% increase over the same two year period, 11% increase. Positive drivers increased by double from 2009 to 2015. Yep. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's six other states, I think, that in 2016, so they're working towards California, one of them, Alaska, 
uh, Maine. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but so I think it accounted for 75 million people. So just a quick recap. Marijuana is not prescribed. Its effects last longer than six hours. Likely to be in everybody's workplace. It is four times stronger today than it was a decade ago. It is in fact addictive. And it, we know it's likely going to be recreational legally in Canada this year. And it's going to have consequences to safety. Okay, so um, after the last presentation, uh, I guess there was a, some, uh, I'm going to just kind of break from the presentation a bit. And as had for, Angel forwarded me some um, questions that people wanted answers. And one of them, and we can go through these and we can talk about it, talk about your safety programs. So the biggest mistake, one of the questions that came from the Sudbury session was, what is the biggest mistake people have made? Okay, so there's a few of them. The first one is firing someone based on a positive test, okay? In Canada, drug and alcohol addiction is considered a disability. So what happens is if someone fails a test or if they come forward and disclose that they have a problem, as an employer, it's your responsibility to ensure that they get accommodation. Doesn't mean that you have to pay for it. What we note, the process you refer them to, we call them a substance abuse expert or professional. And they do an assessment to determine the course of action. Okay, before they, the idea is to get them back to work safely. And um, often that'll be, whether it be treatment, counseling, followed by a return to work test. And we call it unannounced follow-up test, usually for up to about two years. Okay, and on the other side of the coin, uh, there's companies that have an abundance of people working in safety sense of workplaces and they turn, choose to turn a blind eye, even though they've heard from the grapevine that so-and-so, or they've heard from a client that someone was smoking on the site, and some companies just choose not to do anything. Um, anybody heard of the Metron construction case? Okay. So in 2009, um, there was an incident Christmas Eve where four gentlemen, they're on a swing stage on the side of a building. Well, there were six, yeah. And... Um, they were going down and only one of them put their strap on. The stage collapsed. There was a series of factors here. Um, three of them fell to their death. One of them, I think, is paralyzed. And as a result of that, uh, they were, oh yeah, and they discovered by the coroner, coroner reports that they'd all smoked fairly high dosages of marijuana. So there's a series of factors, factors like the rigging wasn't done properly. They all seemed to have gone on the swing stage, but this resulted in the first case, which I'll get to, it's called um, further on. So that's another thing, turning a blind eye. Everyone on that work site knew that they're all smoking, okay? Um, another thing I've seen, it's all very private, and I can't disclose too much, but we've seen companies that um, started testing programs in Ontario, and what happens is they get a bunch of positive marijuana, and it's like, oh, that's not a problem. Oh. Randy, can we um, can we just take marijuana out of the panel? And, like, I don't feel like that's a problem. What people do on their own time is their business. And I've seen companies that have completely stopped their program because they didn't want their, they're worried about losing their whole workforce. So that's the harsh reality of what we see every single day. Um, so this, these companies, go ahead. It's in your policy, but the simple definition is a person's actions or lack of them could potentially hurt themselves or others or the community. Yeah. Absolutely. And it should be in your policy. Your policy, uh, that's the cornerstone. I've kind of got ahead of myself in here, but I wanted to go take it aside just in case we miss out on these things. Um, yeah, so turning a blind eye is a major problem. Can you think of any? Um, okay, so another question was, how are people preparing for July 1st? Okay, so the most important thing is your policy. Your policy, whether you're testing or not, whether it's for reasonable cause, post-incident testing, whatever the, if you have people there in safe workplaces where their actions can harm themselves or others, you should have a policy because it outlines under what circumstances you're going to test. It's going to cover your privacy. 
Um, it's going to cover, you know, everybody's role and responsibilities. It, it, it holds the company accountable. Okay, and it, and it, it outlines guidelines that are going to protect you from legal scrutiny, because, like I said, that incident. Um, it used to be the Westray Bill is now 217.1 in the Criminal Code. So in 1992, um, there was a, 26 minors killed in an accident in Nova Scotia. And apparently there was an outcry after because uh, apparently it had been brought forth that there were multiple safety concerns by supervisors, staff and everything and nothing was done about it. So, and yeah, so this incident with the Metro Open Section is the first legal case where there's actually a supervisor in jail right now. The company went bankrupt because of the legal case. So reviewing your policies for July 1st, having a, educating your staff on how to deal with addiction in your workplace. Those are the two big things. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what uh, we've been doing with these Feed Your Brain series, um, we've had a lawyer that's recently, or three lawyer firms that have recently looked at ours, up to the current case law across the country. Um, we we're more than happy to share that with anybody who would like it. It's not legal advice, but it's based on that. We're more than happy to forward it to anybody in the room that has a safety sense of workplace. Uh, I'd still recommend that you have a legal firm look at it, but it is very, it's very solid. Yeah. Yeah, the, the idea is to keep your workplace safe, really. Testing. Yeah. Does, does testing give a concentration or is it just a plus or minus, positive or negative? It gives a concentration, but a medical review officers are not allowed to give that concentration. Because um, somebody could be, like you said, uh, they could be chronic. So people t some try to associate the levels with impairment. Okay. And all our levels, I don't know if you're familiar, Canada. Drug and alcohol testing came to Canada in the first place because of the NAFTA agreement. Any truck drivers going in and out of the United States had to comply with their random testing program. Before what happened is they'd go to the border, either drop off the truck or if they'd unload it and give it, and then they'd transfer them. So as a result, I think Ontario was one of the first provinces to start an industry. We call it industry testing, primarily like mining, really dangerous workplaces. We're starting to see it manufacturing, um, busing, they're looking at doing busing mandatory and truck driving mandatory. So yeah, so those cutoff levels came from the Department of Health of the United States. And that's based on years of studies to rule out passive exposure. And, just, and they have studies there that state that if you're above that cutoff level, statistically speaking, you're at a much higher risk to cause an incident in your workplace. So marijuana's got a concentration level. Um, Remember Ross Grigliotti, the snowboarder? So he tested positive after he won the first gold medal for snowboarding. Uh, they let him keep his medal. And it wasn't, uh, it was because it wasn't a performance enhancing drug. He was at a party and he smoked because you can't test above that test without actually smoking it. Uh, there's another case that was out in the United States. Um, the kind of part of the studies, there was a woman that got fired from her job because she tested positive for an opiate. And she fought her legal case. She was taking a poppy seed supplement because she was training for a marathon. And she ended up waking up. So that's where they've kind of, and then they've done more studies on that. So they determine cutoff levels. And it's not determining impairment. So in Canada, we've adopted those cutoff levels. And recently the DOT has added extra panels to it too. So we're not sure how industry in Canada is gonna deal with that. Did I answer your question? Um, I, I believe so. So what you're saying is if uh, someone was tested that it would come back yeah, pause. Yeah, so exactly. So I should have. So to make it a little more clear, so um, anybody that tested test positive at the lab, it's always reviewed from a, by a medical doctor. We call it a med, uh, MRO. It's a certified doctor that's trained in addiction. So they have to do a, an interview with the individual before it's even released to your company or a company. So they're going to call and ask the tell the person their rights. Listen, uh, Joe, uh, um, I need to discuss your test result. Anything you tell me from now on, uh, I'm gonna, potentially going to share with their designated employee representative from your company. And then they're going to ask them if they have a valid, if there's a prescription. Often you'll see um, someone's had dental surgery, they might, or if they've had, they're on codeine, 
it'll show up as an opiate. If they can justify it, what will happen is it might get overturned as a negative or potentially a safety advisory. So you, yeah, so there was a different things there. So it's never a positive test unless the doctor concludes it. And there's certain instances which you see people know they're going to test positive and they'll avoid, avoid, avoid. So after 24 hours, the doctor will contact the main contact for an organization, say, listen, I'm t I need to discuss somebody's result. Is there any way you can get them to call me? And at that point, there's a 72-hour clock. And people know they're going to test. If they're applying for a job, they just never bother. People self-select themselves out. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the process. And we've seen those, much the company's chagrin can take over a week because they're waiting to fill a position. Um, smoking weed on lunch. Drive after, is employer, employer liable? Well, I don't think so. Um, if there's no supervisor, the other person's unsupervised. Um, I think if they were to get caught, I think the police would probably. I can't answer that from workplace, I'm not a lawyer, but I wouldn't think that, I don't know how the company would be liable. Um, going in high. What's that one right there, Angel? Oh, there we go. Let's go to this. Go back to that West Ray Bill if I can open this. So it's 217.1, the criminal code. Everyone who undertakes or has the authority to direct another person, does work or performs a task, is under a legal duty to take reasonable steps to prevent bodily harm to that person or any other person arising from that work or task. And that includes, includes your employees. Have a, if you're working beside somebody and you know there's a problem, and, and this is the most challenging thing, um, I can't count the number of companies that I've talked to where individuals where there's one individual that might be clean and the whole crew, they might work on a job that's out of town. So some big companies have small jobs, they have big jobs where there's lots of people around. Um, so it's really, for employers, this is so challenging because, and now that with marijuana being recreationally legal, um, I, I, my heart goes out to the company, so I think just educating your staff as best as possible on the dangers, the liability to themselves, like your employees are liable too. So this is your safety program. So talking about bomb, we'd always hear about human rights, my human rights are violated. So a drug and alcohol program can be, seen, can be deemed discriminatory. But uh, that being said, in Ontario, companies that have implemented properly proper programs, where they have a proper policy and they have what we call it a bona fide occupational requirement, and that's basically related to safety. Okay. Yes. Okay. Anyway, so you. Oh shoot. Okay. Uh, union. Okay. You know what? Um, yeah, let's just let, I'll open the door for questions. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, take too long here. Okay. Okay, so the. So that's a that's a, uh, accommodate. We call it accommodation. So we've got a new. Our lawyers have created a new form. It's called a medical form, and wh what it states on is, uh, an employer would send this form with the individual to their doctor, and it's got a job description on it, stating what they do day to day, and the doctor will fill in whether they are safe to operate when they they're taking that medication, and they'll give the ideas. We call it undue hardship. So if the individual is not able to do that position, um, as an organization, you have to do your utmost to try and, they call it to undo hardship, to try and find a position that they're available. I mean, like if it's an office, and if there's no job available, you just have to be able to justify it and prove that, you know what, if you just say you're um, working on this job, this is the only job that our company has available, this is the only position available, this person can't fill this. Unfortunately, we can't put this person in that position, so we call that undue hardship. So, unfortunately, they can't work in that safety-sensitive job. 
but it's really important to make sure that you follow your policy and do everything right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just applied the same way, and 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 we do know that the, there are studies now that are showing that potentially it can help. It's called uh, accommodation, and uh, in fact, I was speaking with a company last week. They had an individual that uh, suffers uh, severe epileptic seizures, and they had an incident in their workplace where they crashed the vehicle. Uh, this was two weeks ago or three weeks ago. So. They're dealing with that, right? And always consult your lawyer too. Consult your, use your resources, right? Like your policy is going to outline this. You're going to consult your company lawyer. Ensure the doctor is involved. And if the person is unsafe to you, that maybe they just can't do the job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't have any personally. No. Okay. Yeah, if anybody wants to discuss policy, a lot of the uh, remainder of my presentation was kind of discuss, you know, the foundation, the keys of your policy, balancing if you have a union, um, making sure that you're not violating their union agreement, include them in the process from the beginning. Yeah. That's why you require your supervisors. And you know what? This is the one of the key takeaways from this whole thing when I'm talking about the greater than 24 hours. What employees do on their own time does matter. And what's a lot of the governing organizations in Canada, I'll get you sorry, Shannon, um, are saying is that marijuana and uh, dangerous workplaces don't mix. If you're going to, and this is what the Canadian Association of um, Construction Association, where they've got doctors involved, they're saying that marijuana and safety sensitive workplaces don't mix. If you're taking that, then you should maybe find another job. That's a really bold statement, but that's the stance that's being taken. Yeah, but that once again, yeah, you can you can kind of do that, but you still have to do it carefully. You can't discriminate. Um, actions or lack of them could potentially harm or kill others. Yeah. Um, oh, bona fide. That's that's what we call a bona fide occupational requirement. You have to have, be able to prove that there's a three-step. Everything's based on case law. There's no laws governing this in Canada. There's no, every, all the drug testing that's come about in workplaces is based on a series of case law. Like for example, the, the definition of a post-incident, a person's actions or lack of them have to be contributing factors. And it was based on a case where an individual was working in a uh, warehouse and a box fell on his arm and broke his arm. And uh, they tested him the company tested him and fired him. And he won his case because his, the definition didn't match the policy. They didn't have a reason to test him. You have to have a reason. Yeah, and you can't just arbitrarily decide you're going to. They recommend that you, we call it reasonable cause check sheets. You fill out your reasonable cause check sheets and they recommend that you consult your one up. Or if you're if the one up's not around, maybe not a supervisor. See, that's an interesting thing because the Supreme Court ruled that uh, the TCC they're doing lab-based oral fluid testing, and they ordered that they had to raise the level because they're trying to show impairment. It's a legal thing, right? 
But once again, if you look at alcohol, I know they're not the same, but the workplace standard for alcohol is 0 0.04. For in, the, in our society, it's either 0 0.05 or 0 0.08, right? So it's up to industries and organizations. This is, these are the groups right here that are gonna, because the, the government really hasn't even given guidance to the police. It's going to be up to organizations coming together like this and saying, this is, this is what we're going to do. And set the proper guidelines that are reasonable that can be lived by. As an example, where we work, we have a zero tolerance policy for drug use. And if you come in that morning, you look like you have been, and you've got a bad mind, I wake up once, and I'm afraid to get out, and then all the other policies kick in. And yeah, that's another thing. Maintaining privacy, you take the person aside, nobody else should, as best as you can. Yeah, better, you, yeah, yeah, putting it aside, not good. <laughs> So we've got, so you'd have a, you'd set up your program and you'd call 1-800 number and go 1-800-440-0023 and you press option three. It's our post action reasonable cause line. And we try our best to accommodate and normally what'll happen is the individual will get accompanied by a supervisor into the location. That's, that's the most common because it's really hard to have 24 seven coverage for a mobile to come to your site because we do it nationally. And in some locations, some uh, some of our clients have, it's been really challenging for them because some of these areas are very isolated, remote. And yeah, for the, the drug test, yeah. It depends on what kind of, what your program uh, does. It's just a fee for service. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> And the reason why they insist that a supervisor comes, we've actually, um, we had one of our people in our office got really badly attacked last year. So um, we have a lot of companies that have work alone policies. So that's why they want the supervisor there just to ensure safety and they won't come to the site. Okay. So I mean, we could, we could go on about this. But we, and, um, in Edmonton, we are, that's the hub of like the site access testing in Canada. Uh, they do about 120 tests a day, and probably somewhere in the area of 10 to 15 people try and cheat. They'll do anything to try and cheat the test. They will, I mean, you know, given more time, I could go over, over all these things, but um, it's actually in, that's the one place in Canada where cocaine's more uh, prominent than marijuana. Yeah, if anybody wants to give me a call and chat anytime, what, any questions I can't answer today, I'd be happy to take your call. And, Thank you.